Hello, Africa and the rest of the world. Welcome to Continental Prime here on New Central Television, reaching you live from Lagos, Nigeria's economic capital. I'm Suleiman Alede, and here are the headlines for this hour. Authorities in Kenya plan to ban romantic relationships between police officers. Germany agrees to return Nigeria's priceless artifacts stolen during the colonization of Africa. The German humanitarian group Sea Watch has rescued 121 migrants off the coast of Libya in two missions in the past 24 hours. Details of these and others when we return. We begin the news, others are in East Africa, where authorities in Kenya plan to ban romantic relationships between police officers. The Interior Minister, Fred Matianga, says uh, the move is aimed at reducing the high rate of crimes of passion among officers. Matianga says that the regulations need to be approved by the National Security Council, which oversees all the country's security forces. According to him, in the last few months, there's been an increase in spousal murders among police officers. Subject to the clearance of the National Security Council, we will create a new Office of Ethics and Gender Relations directly under the Inspector General. We will adopt the system that has been adopted by the KDF, for example. You are officers. We do not expect you to live here and go to have affairs with your constables whom you are managing. When it gets to that point, one of you has to leave because we must maintain a certain standard of conduct in the police service. We are even insisting to the Inspector General that cases of sexual harassment in the service will be orderly room proceedings type of cases and the officers who are involved should be stripped of their ranks and gotten out of the service. We cannot hope that if we are not disciplined ourselves, we will be able to discipline those who work with us and will be able to offer competent and efficient services to our people. And now joined by Byron Adera, ex-Kenya Special Forces Security Analyst to unpack this further. Uh, good to see you, Byron. Uh, quickly here, the source of spousal abuse and sexual harassment has been on the increase among couples in Kenya's police service. What could be responsible for this? Good to see you, Sloman. I mean, uh, uh, thanks for the question. Very important as well. Uh, I mean, uh, the CS is uh, not any further from the truth. I mean, uh, from where I come, uh, the KDF, the Kenya Defense Forces, as they say, it, uh, it's something that's um, unequivocally uh, spelled out and it's worked fairly well. So, I mean, the CS did not look any further than just an arms away when he needed to benchmark with where this has absolutely scored some very positive goals. To the extent that fraternization is discouraged with the, in the system, uh, we have to look beyond the information presented by the CS, which is, of course, the violence um, discussed here, to issues of how command and control and the excess of authority thereof by seniors may get diluted to a point where it, it gets to affect the outcome of the processes to get, to get, to get themselves involved in, up to and including the management of the force itself, and obviously the welfare issues, and as regards as well, the training of or the preparation of the force itself to be optimized for excellence in service delivery. Uh, what has happened, I think, and which, of course, is rare, as I said, in different uh, postures where we have uh, spousal, you know, violence of, of the police officers engaging in acts that end up taking their own lives of the lives of the spouses, is to an extent um, a deeper problem where uh, we have relationships that are sprung up between senior officers and the junior officers have, you know, in a way engaged in watered down issues or even training. So the preparation itself for the force, and of course the other delivery of service where you find a spouse or maybe a senior officer, perhaps uh, uh, you know uh, disobeying command from other junior officers who are senior to them and who need to task them to do a duty or two. And to a large extent as well, this affects the way 
you know, relationships, um, are, it, work relationships as such are, are, are treated between some officers who are engaged with the seniors in this kind of illicit affairs and end up, you know, disobeying, you know, command and there or, or tasks in terms of, um, you know, where they're supposed to be delivering service. It's not just to themselves, but of course to the general public because the force or the service itself is actually uh, created to deliver service to the general populace. So if we have the police, um, you know, set up in a manner that that, that encourages or, or doesn't work efficiently to discourage this kind of illicit relationships that end up getting in the way of the way they deliver their services, that it, ideally it affects uh, the security of the, uh, you know, delivery of key service by the, the service itself. You know, Byron, uh, off the, the top of my head, I'm thinking this goes beyond love being blind. And again, you know, looking at what is happening now, how can this law effectively address uh, what uh, is termed sexual harassment, especially between uh, a senior officer and a junior officer? Oh, fine. Love, love may be blind, but uh, it may be unblinded by uh, a lot of things. One of them would be the way uh, we, 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 we socialize and, 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 and build organizational culture that it's optimized uh, to help overcome some of the, you know, getting stuck in the mud with, with things that may not be as absolutely important. I mean, I'm privy to the fact that um, relationships get to happen and, and matters emotions may not uh, and mitigated to some extent. But what there is in terms of what um, has happened and what's been witnessed is the fact that the, the affairs here are just a manifestation of, of a deeper rot. One of them would be the way, you know, even the, the, the people get to get into the ranks of the police force itself, which is in, in, in some way corrupt. So you get to have an affair that existed between a senior person in that, that's in the, in the police force and an individual out there, a civilian, that needs to get into the force. So when this happens, then you find out that an individual gets to find themselves into the police force through the ranks of training, which gets to be watered down to some extent because, hey, my wife is down in the training school, please go easy on them. These people get to graduate, and when they get into the ranks and file of the other individuals, then, of course, they have a senior person who's uh, their top cover, who then encourages them to just breeze through things without obeying, uh, you know, the other members that they're working with and stuff like that. So it's deeper than just you know, an affair that develops between individuals, especially if you're close to each other, we know that that may happen. But the deeper issues here and the rot here is the fact that uh, people are not playing in a league where discipline takes deep root, uh, conduct or personal affairs do not get their way into mm -hmm. the, you know, the public affair, especially with regards to the management to the and delivery of authority and command that optimizes the force to deliver against their set objectives. So yes, uh, we may say love is absolutely blind, and that is true to some extent, but we may unblind uh, the blind love by sticking to the dictates and the, the professional ethics of conduct to the, 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 the National Police Service. And we may not need to get to a point where we discuss and, of course, bar people from, you know, enjoying some of the things that uh, life itself treats us, treats us to quite naturally. Uh, what about those who can't find love within the police and uh, such as found uh, in another service, we're talking about inter-service relationship, maybe a soldier who is uh, so madly in love with a police officer. Are there laws in Kenya that is against such romance? Uh, not to the best of my knowledge. Uh, I mean, uh, if, if we start to discuss matters uh, of, of, of a heart, then we may not uh, finish them in a lifetime. <laughs> But ideally, uh, I do not know of any guidelines between the National Police Service and the KDF. I know of members of the uh, the KDF, the Kenya Defense Forces, that have you know have successful marriages that um, are, are flourishing within them. So that the National Police Service. I mean, I may need to mention at this point in time that uh, discipline and, and 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 issues of professional practice uh, may need to be treated a lot more important here. Conversation needs to happen that you may you may have an affair that that exists because love may be blind as you say but if we are all professional and we treat ourselves to the most important business at hand and of course we get into this business knowing what to expect and the job descriptions that the to us i do not know why then this get watered down to a point where we now need to discuss issues of the way we manage our love affairs and things like that so ideally the most important question here for me is the fact that uh, people get into this job, they lose centeredness 
uh, professional ethics get watered down and where other important issues uh, get to now find center stage to a point where they are now on the desk of, 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 of a cabinet secretary to discuss and tell, you know, uh, literally adults that this may need to be controlled because if you are in an affair with a junior person and that junior person gets to mention your name to their, you know, commanders that, you know, I'm known to so and so and so, I don't need to take command from you, that then that actually gets, you know, to affect the entire service with regards to the way they operate and deliver against their core objectives. That is very, very important. So the whole idea is for me that we were to renegotiate our ways and reset to a point where we look at the professional practice and ethics and what is required of the service thereof. Then we may right. need to, uh, yeah, you know, res, you know, have a look at the way our personal conduct um, with regards to we treat our affairs do not need to get in the way. So the well, I think it's a fine, it's a fine place, uh, Byron, for us uh, to uh, wrap this. Uh, many thanks uh, for your time, for unpacking this for us, Byron Adair, ex-Kenya Special Forces uh, Security Analyst there for us. Now, staying in East Africa, Tanzania's President Samia Hassan has been elected as the chairperson of the country's governing party. Hassan was the only candidate for the leadership of the Chamacha Mapinduzi party. Now, the appointment will give the East African country's first female president greater power to influence the membership and activities of the party. Hassan became president when John Magufuli, a coronavirus septic, died in March. Now, she's adopted a very different position, promoting a science-based approach to tackling the pandemic. Hassan has also reached out to Tanzania's political opposition, which has been oppressed for years. In Central Africa, security sources say at least four Cameroonian soldiers have been killed by separatist fighters during an attack overnight into Friday in the west region of the country. A senior security officer said the separatist fighters who were well-armed ambushed and attacked a military post in Memphong locality in Galim subdivision of the region. The officer said two separatist fighters were killed during the attack and several others escaped with wounds. Separatist fighters who called themselves Marines of Bambalang claimed responsibility for the attack and released a video of social, on social media of weapons they seized during the attack. Now, staying in Central Africa, a former government minister in the Democratic Republic of Congo has been sentenced to three years in prison for money laundering and the illegal transfer of funds abroad. Prosecutors have been investigating Willy Bakonga over the embezzlement of funds earmarked for free primary education. Earlier this month, Bakonga was extradited from neighboring Congo Brazzaville, where he had been arrested on board a plane heading for the French capital Paris, carrying $30,000 in February. The World Bank suspended a fast tranche of $100 million, which was to be used to fund free education in DR Congo, or into corruption concerns. Two public education officials in DR Congo were sentenced to 20 years in prison for embezzlement last month. In West Africa, the bodies of three men killed after being ambushed in Burkina Faso on Monday, have arrived in Spain. The two Spanish journalists and an Irish conservationist were filming with an anti-poaching patrol when it was attacked by a heavily armed gang. A militant group has since claimed responsibility for the attack. At the Tarajan air base where the coffins arrived, Spain's Defense Minister Margarita Robles said the fight against terrorism will not stop and Spain and its partners will be relentless about it. The Spanish government is to award its highest honor to the two journalists, David Barrian and Roberto Freire. So the West Africa, Nigeria's President Mohamed Buhari has reaffirmed his belief in the ability of the nation's security forces to overcome challenges posed by insurgents, bandits and criminals. President Buhari said at a top-level security meeting today at the presidential villa in Abuja, the country's capital, that he is prepared to do all it takes to decisively end the assault on the country. The meeting had in attendance the vice president, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, the national security advisor, Babagana Monguno, the president's chief of staff, Ibrahim Gamberi, as well as all the security chiefs. 
A statement from the Office of the National Security Adviser says the Security Council had to adjourn the meeting, which held behind closed doors, till Tuesday when the President will get further briefings from the security chiefs. In the meantime, federal lawmakers in Nigeria have begun tracking a 50 billion naira shortfall in releases made to the Nigerian army. The Senate and Committee on Army had made this known during a meeting with representatives from the Ministry of Finance following a letter from the army. Though the ministry's representatives denied the claims, lawmakers say there's a need to get to the root of the matter as any shortage of funds will affect the ongoing war against terrorism. The, the, the issue of insecurity has become a recurring decimal and an embarrassment to this country. And if the stories that we hear every day from all parts of Nigeria is anything to go by, it is only a matter of time that this system that we call Government of Nigeria will collapse. Yeah. And I think that nobody in any position of authority today will want to accept that Nigeria will collapse on his head. If you say you have made a release of 100%, here is a letter indicating that from the time of the introduction of Operation Lafayette Dole, they have a shortfall outstanding of 50 billion. So if you are paying them 100%, how come do they have a shortage of 50 billion? They wrote a letter to me here requesting us to follow up with you. Distinguished colleagues, I see, I hope you see. Let me explain. The I can explain. Why you say you have made 100 percent? Me, they, uh, they are still working on the, this in, in the office. So we are going to submit to the Secretariat. But this, essentially for the two operations, if you look at it, serial number one, 2019, seven, 75 billion was appropriated. The same was released, 100 percent. If you look at the second line there, the, there was even a supplementation from the service-wide vote, apart from the appropriation, which was released 100%. Number three there is for the Hadar and Daji, 2.5 billion, which was released 100%. Number four there, 2020, 75 billion was appropriated, 74 billion, 74.9, 99, only I think two near hours. So almost 100% was released. Well, as says Nigeria tries uh, so hard tracking that uh, money meant for the army, gender rights groups have called for stricter sanctions against sexual harassment in the country's tertiary institutions. This is as they converged on Abuja, the country's capital, calling on tertiary institutions in the country to adopt a zero-tolerance approach towards the vice. They also launched an app where female students can report cases of sexual harassment, saying students must not only feel safe on campus, but must be allowed to have their voices heard. We cannot continue to allow it to where a girl cannot receive an education with peace of mind. It is important for all tertiary institutions to adopt a zero-tolerance approach to all forms of gender-based violence and promote a healthy culture in the institution devoid of fear and intimidation. Students must feel safe on campus and victims have a right to be heard and not to be intimidated or shamed into silence. We would like school authorities to make the required financial, material, and technical resources available for the implementation of any sexual harassment policies in place. Over 100 tertiary institutions developing their anti-sexual harassment policy. It looks like we still have a long way to go because in general we have over 350 tertiary education in Ni institutions in Nigeria. The issue of sexual harassment has to do with imbalanced power relations. And of course when you look at you know, the statutory obligation of the ICPC, they are statutorily mandated to check institutions on abuse of power. And to the best of our knowledge, sexual harassment is the worst form of gender-based corruption in the environment of learning. We can, you know, together create an environment of learning where the fight against sexual harassment will not be a natural, will not be a daily struggle, but a natural part of our actions. 
actions that is disciplined, actions that are structured, actions that are well managed in the correct sequence and prioritization. Unless you've gone through Nigerian universities and experienced sexual violence or sexual harassment, it might be just another project for you. Some of us have lived it, some survived. I have friends who didn't survive it. Some had to leave school because of that. And so many girls, and especially the female gender, you know, suffer from sexual harassment. It's a dynamic, of, it's a power dynamic thing. And we need to find a way to ensure that survivors can tell their stories without judgment. Nigeria's federal government says it is set to pay pensioners an adjusted pension wage. Executive Secretary Pension Transition Arrangement Directorate Choma Ejikeme says that the government has approved an upward review of pensioners' pay payment and uh, to commence uh, in May 2021. Under the review, also known as a consequential adjustment of pay according to the new Minimum Wage Act of 2020. 19. Presidential approval for the implementation of the consequential adjustment to the pension benefits occasioned by the new minimum wage of 2019 has been granted and the circular released. With this approval, ITAD is now empowered to start the upward adjustment of all pensioners' benefits, according to the approved template. The consequential adjustment of the new pension payment will start from the May 2021 payroll. The areas will take effect from April 2019, and PTAD will also commence payment of the areas from May 2021. Germany has agreed to return to Nigeria priceless artifacts stolen during the colonization of Africa. In 1897, thousands of artworks known as the Benin Bronzes were looted by British troops from present-day Benin in Edo State, Nigeria's southern region. Now, following auctions, some of the bronzes ended up in museums and private collections across Europe. They hold deep cultural significance, and there is growing international pressure to give them back. Berlin's Ethnologics Museum holds more than 500 artifacts from the Kingdom of Benin, most of them bronzes. Last year, France also approved the restitution of its collection of pillaged Benin bronzes. In the meantime, the German humanitarian group Sea Watch has rescued 121 migrants off the coast of Libya in two missions in the past 24 hours. It has tweeted photos of the missions saying 11 women and a baby were among those rescued on Friday morning. Sea Watch says it spotted the first group on Thursday evening within a day of returning to the rescue zone. In the Mediterranean, another European group, SOS Mediterranean, says that its vessel, Ocean Viking, picked up 236 migrants in the zone over the past few days. It adds that survivors spoke of being beaten to make them board flimsy rubber boats as they were worried by the sea conditions. Now, Muslim Ummah of southwest Nigeria has published a book titled Islam in Yoruba Land history, education, and culture. The book seeks to give clarity to questions asked about the history of Islam in Yoruba land. New Central's Bernard Akedi attended the book launch and brought back this report. For centuries, the history of Islam in Yoruba land has been something of a controversy. In order to set the record straight, the Muslim Umar of southwestern Nigeria, Muswen, launched a book titled Islam in Yoruba land, history, education and culture. The book launch was well attended by government officials, Islamic scholars, religious leaders and custodians of Yoruba tradition and culture like the Oniru of Iruland and the Oni of Ife. <laughs> Former Chief of Naval Staff Admiral Jubila Aila presented the book amid cheers from all attendees physically and virtually present. 
I want to commend Muslim as Muslim Society of Western Nigeria for putting this together and for all it has been doing to bring together all Muslims in the southwest of Nigeria. Muslim President General Alaji Rasaki Oladejo described the book presentation as historic for Muslims in southwestern Nigeria. According to him, it was a realization of a dream to set the historical records of Islam in Yoruba land straight. Virtually all the books written in English language about Islam in Yoruba land were in accordance with the perceptions of their writers. In defiance of the divinely guided norms of Islam. This was because the earliest Yoruba Muslims did not trust enough the pouch in which Western system of education was peered at its inception in Nigeria. The Sultan of Sokoto and President General, Nigeria Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs, Al Haji Mohammed Sad Abubakar, noted that aside from history, religious leaders and scholars across Nigeria must rise up and feed their followers with the truth and true meaning of the faiths they profess. If all Muslims hold on to the way of love of Islam and do what is right based on Islamic tenets, and if all Christians do what is right based on the Christian tenets, then definitely there will, not be, there will be no problem in this country. The Oni of Ife, in his closing remark, called for a harmonious relationship among all tribes in Nigeria, irrespective of their religious backgrounds. The event ended with members of Muswen feeling confident that the book will achieve the purpose of better educating Muslims and non-Muslims alike of the true history of Islam in Yoruba land. Bernard Akede, New Central Lagos. Coming up, Stephen Karanja, a Kenyan doctor who became a vociferous opponent of the COVID-19 vaccine, has succumbed to the virus. Details of this and more when we return. African countries have acquired a total of over 37.1 million COVID-19 vaccines so far. Now, this is according to the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Africa CDC. It says 17.9 million COVID-19 doses have been administered out of that, over 37.1 million acquired by member states. Now, the figure corresponds to a converge coverage of just 1% of the continental level with 0.37 of the population having received a full vaccine regimen. Now, the Africa CDC adds that the five member states have administered the most doses of COVID-19 vaccines to their respective populations. Now, in East Africa, a Kenyan doctor who became a vociferous opponent of the COVID-19 vaccine has succumbed to the virus weeks after saying the jab is totally unnecessary. Now, chairman of the Kenyan Catholic Doctors Association, Stephen Karanja, advocated steam inhalation and hydrochloroquine tablets. Now, he clashed with the Catholic Church over the safety of the COVID-19 jabs, while health authorities and the World Health Organization rejected his claims. The Kenyan Conference of Catholic Bishops also distanced itself from Karanja's view on the COVID-19 vaccines, saying the vaccines are legit and ethically acceptable. Persevido Karanja shared criticizing the COVID-19 vaccine. To the people of Africa and especially to the people of Kenya, this vaccine is not a vaccine. This is a genetically modified product that is being injected in people. It is going to be injected in many countries in Africa. Africa, you must. 
Well, still in Africa, Uganda has confirmed one case of the devastating Indian COVID-19 variant. All passenger flights from India into the East African country have been suspended until further notice. Effective May 1, all travelers from or through India, regardless of route, will not be allowed into Uganda. The country has so far reported 41,797 cases so far and 342 deaths the virus to transmit more efficiently from person to person, an infection from some may result into severe illness. The variants currently circulating include the following, the Indian variant, the South African variant, the Nigerian variant, the United Kingdom variant, and the Ugandan variant. All passenger flights between Uganda and India are suspended until further notice. Still ahead, Hong Kong democracy activist Joshua Wong and three others plead guilty to participating in an illegal assembly on June 4 last year. More on this when we return. Stay with us. Officials in India's capital, Delhi, have been urged to find more sites for cremations as morgues and crematoriums are overwhelmed by masses of COVID-19-related death. Now, a second wave of the virus is ravaged in parts of India, with over 386,000 new cases reported on Friday. That's the biggest one-day increase on record for any country. Now, there were 3,500 deaths nationwide and nearly 400 in Delhi, a record for the capital. The total number of infections in the country has now passed 18 million. The first consignment of emergency medical supplies from the U.S. arrived on Friday. Part of what the White House says will be more than $100 million worth of support. The Hong Kong democracy activist Joshua Wang and three others on Friday pleaded guilty to participating in an illegal assembly on June 4 last year. The event was to commemorate the 1989 crackdown on protesters in and around Beijing's Tiananmen Square. Wang already in prison after he was found guilty of participating and organizing an unauthorized assembly during the mass 2019 pro-democracy protest pleaded guilty in a district court. The other activists who pleaded guilty were Lester Shom, Janelle Leong, and Tiffany Yearn. Another activist, Eddie Chu, asked for an adjournment, and his case will be heard on June 11, with 19 others facing similar charges. Now, First Bank of Nigeria has issued her first press release over the sack of her board members by the Central Bank of Nigeria on Thursday. The bank aligned with all the directives of the CBN and assured her stakeholders of continually service and progress. Now, details of these and more in tonight's business news with Tulu Lokpe. Thank you so much, Suleiman. And this is business on NC Continental Prime. We start in the eastern part of the continent where Kenya's Lamu Port General Manager Abdullahi Samatar has announced that officials will start testing operations of the new Lamu Port at the end of next month, ahead of the June 15th commissioning. The first batch of equipment, including low load trailers, extension cargo handlers, and trailers to be used at the multi billion shilling facility, arrived at the port on Wednesday. The second batch, including rubber-tired gantries, forklifts, and utility vans, are expected by mid-next month. The viability of the port, which has seen the first three berths completed at about 5.1 billion Kenyan shillings, that's $48 million, has been put into question over low demand as it was expected to attract transshipment business, mainly from Ethiopia and South Sudan. The port is a key part of the wider Lamu Port South Sudan Ethiopia Transport Corridor, which is being implemented at a total cost of 2.5 trillion Kenyan shillings or $24 billion.
Moving to the southern part of the continent, South African Airways Plane Maintenance Division has announced that it is cutting jobs to help navigate the crisis that gripped the air travel industry throughout the coronavirus pandemic. According to a statement from the carrier's technical team, the restructuring is unavoidable in light of reduced demand from its airline customers. While the state's own company didn't specify how many employees would be affected, Derek Manns, a representative of the Solidarity Union, said about 60% of a total workforce of just over 2,000 could be eliminated. The airline has been mired in bankruptcy proceedings and its own major job cuts plan, while international travel restrictions to contain the spread of COVID-19 have hampered efforts to resume even partial service. Nigeria's banking sector is still coming to grips with the decision of the Central Bank of Nigeria to remove some members of the board of First Bank of Nigeria. We have the details in this report. The oldest bank in Nigeria has been in the news for the wrong reason since April 28, when the Ibukun Awoshika-led FBN board sacked the current managing director, Shola Adiruta, and replaced him with his deputy, Binga Shobo. The action led the Central Bank of Nigeria to query the decision. According to the governor of the CBN, Godwin Emefiele, since the now reinstated Adiruta came into office, ended bad credit decisions, significant and non-performing insider loans, and poor corporate governance practices. A financial expert, Mukhtar Mohammed, shared his opinion. So when you talk about protection of customers, we understand that it's been the CBN strategic role in any um, um, when it comes to finance of any bank but we've not seen any 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 systemic crisis in CBA in first bank that have to do with liquidity mm -hmm. we are seeing a crisis that has to do with management managerial crisis not liquidity crisis so you can't be saying you are protecting customers because we've not gotten anything that has to do with that the bank was low in liquidity the bank was not able to meet their demand and those that are supposed to protect investors is not the cba it's supposed to be the security and exchange commission because mm. they are the one that's strictly responsible for investors so that's why we have the challenge initially people said why is cbn just protect the cbn have told us that they are not always interested in the in, in, in the in the shareholders when the bank is doing that they expect to, they are always interested in the customer the depositors in those banks so for them to say they are protecting the customers and also protecting the shareholders, uh, I think is, is one statement that has a lot in it that I, for one, doesn't understand. He had a projection into what could be the result of this drama. The CBN is still, is still something that we in the financial sector are still trying to digest and, and explain what more. But like you said, it's the, the MD is still there. So, and I mean, in terms of running of the bank, there won't be any crisis in running of the bank, which is good. And even if it was going, they, were, they already appointed the, the deputy MD to become the, the MD. And even up to this moment, the, form, the, M, the, M, the deputy MD that was made the MD has been returned to his position mm. as deputy MD. So, um, what do we expect from now? We expect to see the share of First Bank going down because of the crisis that what we expect. Oh, by and by that the result that came in from first bank yesterday was not also fantastic that's the only only thing i'm so certain that will happen okay. every other thing uh but i wish i knew investors and the banking public should not worry since the worst seems to have passed in this issue and hopefully no further crisis would affect the century old bank and staying in the West African nation, Nigeria's Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, has announced that the federal government is engaging the African Development Bank to set up a $500 million innovation fund through the Technology and Creativity Advisory Council. He also said that the government would reconvene the council on policies that will support the ecosystem for ICT startups in the country. The fund will provide support for the ecosystem across five pillars, including infrastructure support, finance, skills development, and technical assistance. The vice president also explained that African startup ecosystem opportunities depend on innovation capacity and entrepreneurial capacity, all anchored on the fourth industrial revolution and driven primarily by digital technologies. Professor Shimbajo hoped that the fourth industrial revolution would be an opportunity for Africa to leverage and develop its ICT startup ecosystem. And that's the business we have for you right now on NC Continental Prime. My name is Solulokwe Adileru Balogun. It's back to Suleiman. Well, thanks, Solulokwe. Now on 
NC Trends uh, tonight. Uh, stories from Nigeria, Kenya and Congo dominated the space all day. Now, if you want to know more about the stories, let's join Sean Bankoli for the exclusives. <laughs> To resolve the lingering herders and farmers crisis, President Buhari introduced the Human Settlement Policy, also called the Ruga Policy, in 2019. So why is Ruga resurfacing across the timeline today? We'll find out in a bit. Welcome to NC Trends. I am Sheon Bankoli. The presidency has urged Governor Samuel Autumn of Benue State to accept Ruga and cooperate with President Buhari if he wants peace in Benue. This comes after the recent killings in Guma Local Council of Benue State by suspected killer herdsmen, which was attributed by the presidency to Autumn's rejection of the Ruga settlement, a policy that Autumn described as deceptive and against the interests of Benue indigents, who are predominantly farmers. Now let's take a look at what people are saying online. At JB Adamu said that Ruga is rejected by all Nigerians and there can be no Ruga in Benue or anywhere in Nigeria as Ruga will serve as slaughter abattoirs for Fulani headsmen killings in Nigeria. Fulani should establish ranches for their cows and governments should have no hand in it. Ranches are private businesses. Senior man Omolu Abi once tweeted that it is the people of Benue that should fall victim to this ruga of a thing. Benue tradition will be a thing of the past because Fulani will take total control of that state, then install their emir. Cattle business is a private business. The government of Benue state should ban cow meat. Now to the last tweet on that one. Uche Naodogu tweeted, it was so obvious. Bornu, Niger and KB state have enough land to cater for all the cows in West Africa, not just in Nigeria, but no. Small Bayelsa state with seven local governments should still release land for Ruga. Hmm. Now that's all on Ruga. Let's now take a trip to East Africa, Kenya to be precise, where the hashtag People's March to State House is trending. Now Kenyans are demanding the immediate end to police brutality, lifting of the partial lockdown, rights to land for everyone, among others. Now let's check out some of their comments on social media. Definitely Lucky tweeted and said that Kenyans are tired. We are tired of being tired. I mean, it's about time that people march to state house to set priorities straight. A government that eats its own citizens is doomed and failed. The... Oh, okay, I'll allow my Kenyan friends to take over this one. Moving on to the next tweet. Social Justice Center's working group tweeted, the government has failed Kenyans in so many ways, including depriving its citizens basic commodities according to Article 43 of the Kenyan Constitution. Finally on that one, Dr. Lucy Kirutu tweeted, will the hashtag people's march to state house be virtual? I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> All right, that ends it on Kenya. Finally on NC Trends today, citizens of the Democratic Republic of Congo are crying out on social media in response to the violence and massacre going on in the Mulenge community. The Banya Mulenge people, often labelled as outsiders due to their Rwandan origin, have suffered continuous violence and genocide. On Twitter, at Habi Chris says that no one should be killed because of his or ethnic origin, religion or belief. It is now the time to intervene and stop the massacres against Banya Mulenge in the Democratic Republic of Congo. At United Nations and other NGOs, please do not fail again. Hashtag Save Mulenge. Karangwa Sewase, pardon me, says that the international community has to join hands to stop the killings that are targeting Banya Mulenge. We must not close our eyes. It motivates the killers. Hashtag Save Mulenge. Finally on that one, Anita says that is someone watching, how many more genocides will the world have to face to say no and actually mean no? Hashtag Monosco, are you there? I thought 1994 taught us something, but I was wrong. Hashtag Save Mulenge. Now that wraps up NC Trends for today. Let's get back to the news. Well, anyway, thank you, uh, Sheo. Now, in sports, I got carried away looking at uh, those trending matters from across the continent. Now, let's talk about sports. The Afghan Champions League and the Confederation Cup draws we are done today. Udoka has the rest of that report. Uh, how are you doing uh, tonight, Udoka? I'm very well, and it's all about the CAF Champions League. Mm.
All right, taking it away, at Friday's draw for the quarterfinal stages of the African Champions League and the Confederation, Confederation Cup has produced the tie that most football fans had hoped for. Now, record African Champions League winners Alali of Egypt and the South African coach Pito Musumane will take on his former club Mamelodi Sundowns in the quarterfinals for a third successive season after the draw was made in Cairo. Now, the clash is also uh, putting Pito Musumane, the coach of holders Alali, against his former club in an already tense rivalry. Now, the quarterfinal draw for the continent's secondary competition, the African Cup of Nations and, of course, the Confederation Cup, was also conducted on Friday. Pyramids of uh, Egypt to take on Enyimba of Nigeria. The quarterfinal ties will be played on the 14th to the 15th of May and uh, the 21st to the 22nd of May. Now the semifinals are set for June 18 and 19 and June 25 and 26. The Confederation Cup final will be played on the 10th of July and the Champions League final will also be played on the 17th of July. The venues for the finals have yet to be determined by the Confederation of African Football, a great one to look forward to talking about the CAF Champions League and the Confederation Cup. Moving on to our next story, the Malagasy Football Federation has suspended its French coach, Nicolas Dupuy, until further notice, without pay. In a letter to the coach, the FMF said the coach spent more time pursuing commercial interests for personal publicity than on the team whose image had uh, recently regressed. As a result, Dupuy was said to have been neglecting his main role of managing and his deputy, his duty of supporting the Malagasy football. While the Frenchman, who has yet to comment, is serving the suspension, Eric Rahad Sandratana will be in charge of the national team as head coach. Now, the former Paris Saint Germain defender will prepare the team for June's opening 2022 World Cup qualifiers at home to Benin before traveling to play Tanzania. And Dupuy was appointed by the Madagascar in 2017 and led the team to a maiden appearance at the African Cup of Nations uh, two years later. Moving over to South Africa, a huge turnout of canoes for the recent South African Spring Championships as Shangweni Dam ensured the event was a success despite the packed calendar. Now, national champions were crowned from under eight to seniors underscoring a continued resurgence of interest in flat water paddling in the country. Now, paddlers from all over the country descended on the dam for the championship that gave a number of young aspiring paddlers the opportunity to race on the national stage for the first time as the event doubled as a selection event for the Junior World Championships, uh, which is coming up later this year, but also for the Olympic hopes uh, for the regatta. Over the three days of racing, over 270 pad paddlers took to the water in the various age categories with the boys under the 14 age category being the biggest group with 39 paddlers fighting it out for the honors which were claimed by Ayanda Mpiti from the Asizenzele Primary School in Cattle Ridge. Now the men's overall crown went to under 23 star Alex Massina ahead his fellow under 23 paddler Sam Bocha in second and Jody Marebe in third. Now moving over to uh, go, uh, rugby now, Ireland's planned summer tour to Fiji has been cancelled because of uncertainty caused by the pandemic. In the past week, lockdowns have been announced across the Pacific country, including the capital Suva, amid a rise in COVID-19 cases. And the IRFU says the recent developments mean that planned tour scheduled to be held in July is no longer viable. And the governing body remains hopeful of arranging alternative test matches for the July international window. Now, Ireland were hopeful of travelling for a three-test series with head coach Andy Farrell, ruling himself out of the running for a place in Warren Gatland's British and Irish Lions coaching staff in order to focus on his Ireland role. And lastly, Cheetah's centre William Small Smith uh, has announced his retirement from rugby due to the effects of a serious head injury. And the 29-year-old Small Smith hung his boots following a 10-year professional rugby career. After sustaining an injury during a Curry Cup match against the Sharks in December 2020 in Bloemfontein, William has been medically advised to retire from the game. And the talented midfielder joined the Cheetahs in 2016 and made 91 appearances uh, from 25 Curry Cup, 5 Super uh, Rugby Unlocked, 47 Pro 14 and 14 Super Rugby. He made his professional debut for the Blue Bulls at under-21 level in 2011 and represented the side in 7 Super Rugby and 15 Curry Cup matches bringing his career total to 113 professional caps. William Small Smith represented South Africa on the international stage, winning gold medals as part of the Springboks' seven teams and the junior Springboks. And the South African website wished William Small Smith nothing but the very best with his future plans.
And that's a wrap on the sports update on the news. I'm Udoka Njoku. Back to you, Sulai. Well, man, thanks, uh, Udoka. Now, uh, I'm forced to ask uh, you what kind of uh, music you love, uh, what genre of music you love, rap, trap, Afro, well, fusion, or jazz? Actually, I'm a big fan of um, rap and soft jazz. Never mind, I'm not going to ask you to rap. Thank you very much, because now the International Jazz Day has had extraordinary successes over the past decade, becoming the world's largest annual celebration of jazz. Now, Sam Dandy on Entertainment News uh, focuses on this special genre of music and what the International Jazz Day entails. Thank you very much. And now to Entertainment News. Jazz, a genre of music heavily based on swing, blue notes, and complex chords, picked up speed and mastery across various countries into different styles and forms. Celebrated on the 30th of April, International Jazz Day honors the sound and all the beautiful music this genre has influenced. Now, New Central's Chidimai Hanitsu has more in this report. <laughs> There's been a lot of um, development in jazz. So you have your smooth jazz, you have your traditional jazz, you have your straight head, you have your um, African Afro jazz right now. International Jazz Day is celebrated on April 30 every year. It is a day dedicated by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, in 2011 to highlight jazz and its diplomatic role of uniting people across the world. Today marks the 10th anniversary celebration of jazz music. The music curriculum is not that heavy. It's not, you know, like... Um, other parts of the world, but um, there's been a lot of influence of jazz with oh, uh, a lot of people um, playing instruments in Nigeria. The International Jazz Day is celebrated across countries to bring together communities, artists and jazz enthusiasts to learn more about the music, its roots, future and impact. The true jazz lovers will carry on anyways, with or without um, the government. We have never had government uh, support or even involvement. So apart from, I remember um, Cross River State, uh, when the governor was, uh, Governor Donald Duke, and that's because he himself was a saxophone player. You know, that's the only person really, really that, that you know, did more. The day itself is intended to highlight the need for human rights and dignity by drawing public attention to jazz and its extraordinary heritage throughout the month of April. Jazz is the essence of music. Um, jazz is also, I mean, it's everything. Jazz is, music is nothing with, without jazz, as far as I'm concerned. International Jazz Day is undoubtedly a celebration to be aware of and participate in if one is looking to expand his horizons and music knowledge. Happy International Jazz Day! Chirima Ihanitsu, New Central Television. Indeed, jazz music composition and style has evolved through the years as every performer has his or her own interpretation to the genre. In Africa, many recognize the Kuti family as the most influential in grooming and involving the jazz sound into what many now call Afrobeats. Popularly regarded as the king of Afrobeats, a music sound adopted from the richness of jazz. Olufela Anikola Kuti was a Nigerian multi instrumentalist. After his passing in 1997, at the age of 58, his legacy lives on through his children and the growing contribution to the future of the African sound in many parts of the world. Today, many of the most successful African and Nigerian artists have attributed their inspiration and that of the music industry to the Afrobeat sound Fela pioneered decades ago. His children have also followed in these footsteps. 
as activists and as musicians. From award-winning best-selling African artist Femi Kuti, Fela's eldest son, Madi Kuti, Fela's grandson, the lineage is rich in art and music. On the 5th of February, Femi Kuti and his son Madi Kuti released Legacy Plus, the album. Packaged into a double album, Legacy Plus consists with music that not only inspires but sheds light on social struggles within the country. We celebrate three generations of Afrobeats. We're setting the Kuti family would hold the torch in showcasing Afrobeats for generations. Oh Today we celebrate three generations of the jazz sound evolution and its influence over other genres all across the African continent and beyond. Well, that's all our entertainment news. I am Sam Dandy. Well, thanks, uh, Sam. And of course, uh, talking about the weather in Lagos, it's been partly cloudy in some parts of Lagos with high humidity. Well, the Met Desk has more. <laughs> That's all on the news at this hour, but before we go, let's bring you a recap of our top stories. Authorities in Kenya have planned to ban romantic relationships between police officers. Germany has agreed to return Nigeria's priceless artifacts stolen during the colonization of Africa. The German humanitarian group Sea Watch has rescued 121 migrants off the coast of Libya in two missions in the past 24 hours. Now follow us on social media, we're at New Central TV. You can also catch up with our news and programs. Just download the New Central TV mobile app on Play Store and iOS. You can also watch us live in Star Times Channel 274. I'm Suleiman, uh, later many thanks for watching.